Good afternoon. Excuse me. Good afternoon and welcome to the FCCJ. My name is Aaron Sheldrick and I work for Reuters. Iran stands on the brink of a return to the international fold after a landmark agreement on its disputed nuclear program last November. The program has been a sore point, to say the least, in international diplomacy for, for the better part of a decade. Um, in return for some sanctions relief, Iran is taking steps on curtailing the, its nuclear activities. And so far, the agreement has, is, is working. To talk about the deal and other aspects of, of uh, Iranian foreign policy, today we have Mohammad Javad Zarif, the foreign minister of Iran, um, who will make, a brief, make some brief remarks and then we'll open the floor to questioning to journalists only. Um, before, uh, I just have uh, one more thing to say. There, there will be simultaneous translation um, in both English, uh, sorry, Japanese and Persian, I understand. And uh, pl everyone, please make sure you turn off your, uh, your phones and other mobile devices. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be with you in FCCJ uh, and to participate in, in hopefully a dialogue with you. So I'll make my comments, introductory comments brief so that we can use the better half of uh, the whatever time that I'll be with you uh, for a conversation that I hope will be useful. Uh, I think what has happened in the last several weeks and months in, in Iran and in the international community uh, has been a consequence of the opportunity that was provided to all of us by the Iranian people, who went in huge numbers to the polls, proved all the pundits wrong, and elected uh, a candidate who believed in maintaining and protecting the rights of the Iranian people as well as their dignity and integrity through engagement and dialogue. The Iranian people 73% of the electorate went to the polls, restoring the social capital that is such an important ingredient of Iranian power, because we rely in Iran, first and foremost, on the people. And these people made a choice. They made a choice to engage. This choice was a rational choice. It was a choice based on a sober assessment of realities. But it was a choice not because of economic hardship, but because of a demand for respect. They chose a president or a candidate they thought could best assure respect for Iran and the Iranian people across the world. And based on this choice, we started to engage. And the international community, sometimes it's difficult for me to talk about the international community. I've got to talk about the West. Because last time I met the West, group of E3 plus 3 or P5 plus 1, 
I told them that you assume that you represent the international community and I'm just coming from a meeting that I chaired consisting of 120 members of this international community, which we call the Non-Aligned Movement. And Iran happens to be the chairman of that. So whatever we call the international community or in your terminology, international fold, I'm not interested in, in debating definitions. But the West uh, engaged Iran based on a recognition, in my view, that the previous policies had not worked. And I believe it's important, it's extremely important for all of us to recognize that. We engaged for some eight to 10 years in a process that does not belong to 21st century. We live in a different global environment. The global environment of today is much different from the global environment of the 1960s and 70s, where you could have a zero-sum approach to international relations, where you could gain influence at the expense of others, where you could progress in a world that was deprived, when you could maintain your security at the expense of insecurity of others. That world has changed. So if you engage in zero-sum approaches to international relations, everybody is bound to fail. And I believe this reality sunk in. That is, everybody understood or came to understand, or I hope will come to understand soon, that eight years of sanctions against Iran have produced economic hardship, have created resentment among the Iranian people that they cannot even purchase medicine using open banking channels, but has not stopped Iran's nuclear program, has in fact increased the number of centrifuges spinning in Iran by many folds. When the sanctions started, Iran only had 200 centrifuges. When we started negotiations, Iran had 19,000. So if, you, if you're a calculating person, sanctions produce 18,800 centrifuges. That is the net outcome of sanctions. And a lot of resentment in Iran that the West does not want Iran to make progress, that the West is trying to put pressure on the Iranian people not to even be able to buy medicine. And I think this realization allowed us to engage in a process based on a different approach. And the different approach was, on the one hand, Iran does not seek nuclear weapons does not see nuclear weapons as enhancing its security, even considers the perception that Iran has a clandestine nuclear weapons program as detrimental to its security. We do it not out of being good people, which we are, but out of a very serious strategic calculation that in our immediate neighborhood, we are already the most powerful. And we need to go out of our way in order to convince our neighbors that we do not have any intentions against them. Although for 250 years, Iran has never waged a war against any of its neighbors. But nevertheless, just the power asymmetry, just the disparity in size, population, natural resources, uh, human potential, Geography, all of this, creates a type of uh, anxiety which we have had to address. Even a perception that we are seeking nuclear weapons would even further augment this anxiety. And in the wider region and globally, Iran is not able, either directly or through proxy, to engage in deterrence, 
in nuclear deterrence. So strategically, it doesn't make sense for Iran. Now, people want to create smoke screens behind which to justify policies. But that's nothing new. But if you think strategically, it doesn't make sense for Iran to have nuclear weapons. Historically, Iran was a victim of chemical weapons and did not respond in kind. We were the victim of larger scale use of chemical weapons by Saddam Hussein. And six United Nations investigations have proven time and again that Iran did not retaliate. In addition to this strategic and historical outlook, we have a religious and ideological prohibition of nuclear weapons. The leader of the Islamic Revolution has a religious decree, a religious edict, that nuclear weapons are prohibited under Islamic jurisprudence. So that is from our perspective. We have nothing to lose, to show to the world, and everything to gain, actually, that we don't intend to have a nuclear weapons program. But I venture to say that the West should also share an objective with us. And I hope that they have started to share that objective. And that is, you cannot wish Iran's nuclear program away. You cannot entertain illusions of a zero enrichment option. And that is because of the fact that Iran has the technology, the know-how, the scientists, workshops, that produce centrifuges. So you cannot simply have the illusion that Iran, because of pressure or coercion, will simply give up. Actually, if I were sitting in Washington or anywhere else, and an Iranian official came to me and said, we want to dismantle our nuclear program, I would be suspicious. Because how to dismantle science, how to dismantle technology. If somebody told you that they're going to dismantle a capability, you should assume that they're going to make it underground. They're going to keep it, take it to a more discreet environment. So the best way for the West to ensure that Iran's nuclear program will always remain peaceful is to ensure that Iran has a transparent nuclear program, something that is on the ground so that these capabilities are exercised under international monitoring with the, with the ability of the IAEA to examine and to verify Iran's peaceful intentions. And that is, I believe, a common objective that we can have, an Iranian nuclear program which will remain exclusively peaceful. And based on this common and shared objective, we started a process of a non-zero-sum game. That is a positive-sum game, because the zero-sum approach that we've had had created a negative-sum outcome. Everybody had lost. Iran's economy had uh, suffered. At the same time, the West did not achieve its intended uh, ambition of uh, the zero sum enrichment of the zero enrichment option. So now we are approaching something on a positive sum or a win win game. That is, Iran will have an enrichment program that will remain exclusively peaceful. Based on this, we have made a landmark agreement which many believed would never be possible. Many thought that breaking this climate of distrust was impossible, but we did it. It took a lot of political will, it took a lot of courage, but we did it. A lot of people tried to torpedo it. 
It seems to me that 14,000 people have poured into Washington right now in order to torpedo it. But I don't think they'll succeed because there is no other game in town. That's the only game. That's the only reasonable game. Not only we succeeded in reaching an agreement, we succeeded in implementing that agreement. Again, against all odds. And now we are engaged in the next round, that is to reach a final agreement. A final agreement is more difficult and easier at the same time. It's easier because the ice already is already broken. We have already passed that hurdle. So we can pass the next hurdle. It's more difficult because we need to deal not with a temporary solution, but with a more permanent situation. It's not uh, something that uh, could be achieved in one meeting requires a bit of work on technicalities, details. So we had basically six months to do it. Uh, of course, that can be extended to another six months, but we hope to be able to do it within the first six months. We've started the process, I, I think, uh, rather well. We agreed on generally on what we needed to uh, cover. Uh, in fact, the Geneva uh, joint plan of action, which was adopted on the 24th of November, uh, tells us what we need to cover. And I'm sure with political will and good faith, we will be able to reach an agreement and to start implementing it in the near future. That would remove what I believe from the very beginning was an unnecessary crisis and will open possibilities for dealing with other issues that are more important for us in the region and globally. And I think that would be a strong uh, benefit to international non-proliferation regime, which is so important to Japan and as important for Iran, because we both live in neighborhoods that have been littered with these dangerous weapons. And we both want to remove them not only from our neighborhoods, but hopefully from the world at large. That, I hope, will serve as an enticement to questions to come from you. Thank you very much, Foreign Minister. Um, point taken uh, on your point about international fold. I can assure you it was a very loose uh, shorthand, <laughs> uh, but understood on the point about the non-line movement, of course. OK, we'll open up the floor to questions. Uh, please state your name and affiliation clearly. Who would like to ask the first question? Yes. Yeah, sorry, please approach the mic. I apologize. How does this work? OK, I'll put it here. Oh, I I represent uh, Russian state agency ITARTAS. Uh, my name is Yaroslav Makarov. I would like to ask uh, Minister about uh, his opinion on the role of Russia in uh, the nuclear, nuclear uh, talks uh, with Iran and uh, what are the future prospects uh, of uh, this cooperation? Thank you. Well, we, we have very strong relations with Russia because Russia is an important neighbor. Uh, our relations with Russia are not a reaction to anything, but are based on their own merits. We've had historical ties with neighbors, uh, and we will continue to have close neighborly relations. Uh, 
Uh, Russia is an important partner for Iran in the nuclear industry. Uh, it's, it's built a nuclear reactor, uh, a power plant, and we hope that that cooperation will continue. Uh, we are uh, discussing with Russia the possibilities for building further uh, nuclear power plants. Uh, as the initial agreement that we had with Russia provides for further cooperation in that area. The role that Russia has played as a member, as a permanent member of the Security Council in P5 plus one has been a generally positive role. Of course, we did not like it when Russia joined uh, the rest of P5 in imposing sanctions on Iran, but since then, we see the role that Russia is playing as a positive one. It's an important member of the E3 plus 3 or P5 plus 1, however uh, you want to call them. Uh, and we have been engaged in close consultation with Russia uh, in the process of uh, leading to the agreement on November 24th. And we are now engaged in close consultation with Russia, as we are with other members of P5 plus 1. Uh, we have been discussing various issues on the table with every single member of, uh, of this group, uh, with the United States, with Russia, with the Europeans, with China. Uh, and we hope to be able to reach an agreement with the help of everybody, and we count on the help that we can get from Russia and others in order to reach an agreement. Okay, Colden. Uh, yeah, sorry, let me show you. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> Where it fits, yeah, I don't okay, know. This is an English question coming up. I would ask in English. So. That's good. I, at <laughs> least Arabic. I don't have to wear this. <laughs> but by the time I get to understand how to wear this, we get to Japanese. <laughs> Thank you. Shukran. Thanks for coming to the club. So my name is Khaldun Azare for Panorite News and uh, some Arabic and Iranian media. Uh, my question is, you talked about the neighborhood of Iran. Now there are two crises seems to be in Syria. And in Israel, there are many Arab countries consider the nuclear program of Israel is a threat to their national security on the long term. So how, uh, do, how does Iran uh, look and deal with these two uh, issues? Thank you. Uh, this, the second issue, uh, we, we believe that nuclear weapons have no place in the Middle East. Actually, nuclear weapons, in our view, have no place in the world. Uh, nuclear weapons have not produced security for anybody. Uh, and will not produce security for anybody, neither internal nor external security. And that is why we are a major proponent of creating, establishing a zone free from all weapons of mass destruction in the Middle East. And we believe Israel is the only impediment to, to achieving that. And we believe the international community is on record time and again on the need to unite and to impose whatever pressure, political, that is needed in order to achieve a zone free from all weapons of mass destruction in the Middle East. Now, jumping from that to Syria, I think, and I think this is connected, the removal of chemical weapons from Syria, or at least the agreement to remove chemical weapons from Syria, removed the only excuse that was available to Israel to refrain from disarming. So now there's no excuses. And I'm sure once we have an agreement, Egypt will be prepared to join and destroy it, uh, uh, join the Chemical Weapons Convention. It is already a full member of the NPT, and it will be ready to join Chemical Weapons Convention. Now, Syria is a member. The only non-member of both conventions is Israel, not of NPT and not of Chemical Weapons Convention. So. The entire focus should be placed on, on that. As far as the Syrian situation is concerned, uh, we believe that there is no, absolutely no military solution to Syria. People have tried it, they have failed. Policy on Syria was based on an illusion that a military victory was achievable in two months. Now that policy has led to an utter disaster. 150,000 people have lost lives. 
Now, it's, now I, I think it's the time to change that policy and to accept the reality that there is no military solution in Syria. Needs to be a political solution. That political solution needs to be inclusive. Should be made by the people of Syria. Others outside Syria have no role in telling the Syrian people who should be and should not be governing them. It's for the Syrian people to decide in a free and fair election. And I believe the role that the international community needs to play is to enable and facilitate this uh, final conclusion to emerge in Syria and to allow uh, the Syrians to, to determine their fate freely uh, without uh, external uh, intimidation and interference. Yeah, it's about time to let. Yeah, and let me. Uh, yeah, let you, me do you do it. You do it, please. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and now I'm having trouble. Okay, here we go. Uh, sorry. And then English is channel. Oh, that's not working. Either. I apologize. Sir. Sorry about that. You see. Yes. <laughs> Not only I managed not to be able to do it myself, I managed to confuse him. <laughs> so that takes a lot of doing, yes. but I did it. Let me. Ah, I have ah great. Yeah. Thank your you. Your channel is number 11, is the, is the lower one here. You do the entire thing, yeah. so the entire operation is done by you. Target Shikwe, I'm a freelance. Uh, if the negotiation succeeds, oh, I'm sorry, if it fails, how do you think the Middle East will look like? And if it succeeds, do you think it will have a tremendous impact on the Middle East peace process? After all, you have tremendous influence over Hamas. Well, uh, on your first question, we hope that it will succeed. Uh, we have based all our calculations on, on the success of these negotiations. Of course, it won't be a disaster if it failed. We, we didn't have these nego negotiations for the past 10 years, and uh, everybody continued to, uh, to operate. Uh, for us, it was a bit more expensive to get what we needed, but we did get what we needed. I think that's a better option for the negotiations to succeed. It's a better option for everybody. Uh, on the other question, um, people have tried to uh, make uh, correlations between this and other issues in the region. I, I think the Palestinian problem can only be resolved through addressing the Palestinian problem, not other issues. Other issues were excuses were smoke screens. The Palestinian problem is there because the rights of the Palestinian pe people have been violated, because the Palestinians have been deprived of their most fundamental right to self-determination and to uh, having their own homeland, and the fact that their human rights are being violated on a daily basis. Once that issue is addressed, or in other words, until that issue is addressed, you will not have a resolution of the Palestinian problem. People can find excuses, but nobody's influence on Hamas or other Palestinian groups will be sufficient to change the reality of the situation on the ground and that is the fact that, that the rights are being trampled upon. Reminder to turn off your phones, please, folks. Yes. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. My name is Degawa from NHK, the broadcasting station which produces Dorama Oshin. <laughs> <laughs> My question is about uh, nuclear negotiation with the West, uh, about the additional protocol of IAEA. Is it possible that in the final agreement, Iran will accept and ratify the additional protocol of IAEA? Well, in the, 
in the joint plan of action, which we adopted in Geneva, a reference is made to the additional protocol as a part of the final phase. Of course, the decision to ratify the additional protocol rests with the Iranian parliament, not with us in the government. But, but the Iranian parliament will weigh the costs and benefits whether the benefits of uh, accepting and ratifying uh, are there. What the Iranian people have witnessed in the past several years is that our membership in multilateral agreements has not produced the other side of the bargain because all these international instruments represent a bargain, a carefully balanced bargain. The NPT, we all know, rests on three pillars, non-proliferation, disarmament, and peaceful use. So you cannot uh, make it stand on a single pillar because we haven't had much of disarmament and for Iran, very little peaceful use. So the first, the international community should show to Iran that its adherence to NPT has produced positive outcome for Iran so that our parliamentarians will be encouraged to ratify the additional protocol. I hope in the process we can make it possible. I hope in the process everybody will work together in order to sh ensure that uh, membership in international instruments, in addition to carrying obligations, also carry benefits. That's how you maintain international agreements. Um, hello, Joël Lejean from RTL France uh, Broadcasting. I have uh, two small questions. The first is about Iraq reactor. Um, are you ready to actually uh, do anything to produce less plutonium? And uh, if yes, could you please explain a little bit if it's going to be part of it? And second thing is, um, you mentioned the fatwa. It's most important indeed. And uh, it's a matter of faith and, and trust. I agree with you that you should never enter into use of nuclear weapon. But trust and faith is one thing. What about politics? Isn't it different? <laughs> Sorry, can we clarify? Was that Iraq's nuclear reactor? Iraq. 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 Okay. Not Iran's. No, no, no. It's Iraq. It's a, it's a, it's a, heavy, it's a heavy water nuclear reactor that uh, we have. Uh, the reason we built Iraq nuclear reactor was to produce uh, uh, radioisotopes for medical research and medical purposes and not to produce plutonium. And we believe there are scientific ways of reducing the concerns over plutonium production of a heavy water reactor, and we are prepared with 5 plus 1 to look into them. Although I'm not prepared to negotiate uh, in the media uh, about what we will do at the end of the day, but I, I can tell you that a rock uh, issue can be easily resolved. We're not going to close it. We're not going to dismantle it. We're not going to close or dismantle anything. That is our red line. But we will address proliferation concerns that people may have through either scientific ways or through other means, including monitoring and verification that are, uh, have been made available, including through the additional protocol, but uh, other ways as well. Uh, as, as far as uh, trust is concerned, Mistrust is a two-way street, as trust must be a two-way street. Now, the Iranian people have a lot of mistrust, and I do not want to score any points here, but we have 10% ownership of Eurodif, a French conglomerate. We haven't been able to get a gram of uranium out of that Eurodif. So there is a trust that needs to be built on French side. The French need to show to the Iranian people that they are committed to their words. That is not only Iran that has to uh, implement its agreement. It, I mean, we paid for it. We paid for it a long time ago. Uh, we paid a billion dollars about 40 years ago for our 10% uh, interest in Eurodif. A billion dollars 40 years ago. Had we in invested it in something more reasonable, it would have been a lot of money. But, but we, never can, we never got a gram of its product. But we are prepared, 
through the necessary means to establish that trust. And we expect the other sides to do the same. The fatwa or the religious edict of, of the religious leader is an important element of that because that is the credibility of the Islamic Republic. And we put our credibility online. That's a lot. That's a lot to offer in order to build confidence. And I believe we can, we can move on, on, on that direction and build confidence both ways. Thank you, Your Excellency. I'm Rudolf Tenhut, European Energy Review. Uh, if I'm right, you are here also to discuss cooperation with the Japanese about your nuclear power program. Um, can you elaborate a little bit about this, uh, this uh, nuclear power program? Is it right that you want to add uh, 20 gigawatt by 2020? What is your main drive behind this program? Is it to free up the oil and gas for export? And um, up until now, you cooperate with the Russians, with Rosatom, uh, under the condition that the Russians uh, export or import uh, uh, used uranium back to Russia. How do you think to address that issue with the Japanese in case the Hitachi, Mitsubishi, etc. would land in Iran? Well, uh, you, you, you have a number of questions. Let me try to, to see if I can address all of them. First, why do we need nuclear energy? Uh, this is a decision that was made long time ago, in 1974, actually, by a uh, co by an American consulting firm that did the consulting for for the Shah. Uh, that said, Iran uh, by 2020 should have a an energy basket in which 20 percent of its of that energy basket should come from nuclear energy. Um, and the reason for that is very simple. There, there are much better ways of using our natural oil and gas. Petrochemicals is one. The added value of, of petrochemicals is much better than, than burning your fuel. Uh, and we, we're interested in that. And one, while we're at it, we're interested in Japanese firms to invest in our petrochemicals. We, have 70, we need $75 billion investment in our petrochemicals. So if you're interested in investing, that's one very lucrative area for investment, in addition to our oil and gas sector, where we need over $100 billion of investment. On uh, nuclear cooperation, the Geneva Agreement, which is called JPA for short, Joint Plan of Action, calls for international cooperation in the area of civil uses of nuclear energy. That's a part of the final agreement. So since we are very interested in implementing the Geneva Plan of Action, uh, one of the areas is joint nuclear programs. And we invite everybody uh, to engage in Iran's nuclear program. And Japan is a uh, country with very advanced uh, nuclear energy technology, very safe nuclear energy technology. Now, we're very happy with what we're doing with Russia. The terms, uh, and we're negotiating with Russia on, on further uh, construction of, of other uh, power plants. But, but it's, it's not an exclusive uh, environment. Uh, we have, as you pointed out, the uh, parliament has, agreed, has uh, adopted uh, basically 20 1,000 megawatt power plants. We only have one, 19 are, are, should be forthcoming, uh, and certainly Japan can play a role uh, in doing that. That operation would be a confidence-building operation too, a mutual confidence-building operation too, because just like Russia, which is underground in Iran and knows that we need this for peaceful purposes, Japan can also be underground in Iran and see for itself that Iran's program is nothing but peaceful. Gentlemen here. Thank you, sir. Uh, my question is about economy. And I'm from uh, Nikkei, a Japanese economic newspaper, and I'm former bureau chief of for Tehran. And your name is? Nikkei. My name is Nakanishi. Thank you, sir. And my question is uh, how the uh, economy uh, has uh, you know, recovered 
uh, after the uh, last year's uh, November's agreement of the three plus three, and uh, especially on the aspect of the recovery of trade. Uh, we have hearing that the uh, uh, how the uh, insurance on oil and how the amounts of the oil and. Uh, if you can tell us the uh, amount of the how much money or incomes you can get by the export of the oil. Well, uh, to be absolutely honest with you, I don't have those figures. But uh, I, I can tell you that what has happened since November 24th has been uh, mostly psychological rather than uh, actual uh, changes. Uh, the psychological climate that had been created uh, not only by sanctions but by the arms twisting that uh, the, the Americans tried to do here and there has not crumbled and I think that has an important uh, that is an important factor we are seeing uh, economic impact but the economic impact is mostly due to policies that are pursued by the government, because some of our pro economic problems were due to mismanagement. Uh, and now the new government, uh, w one of our pri priorities uh, of the new government is to try to put back uh, sound ma uh, economic management and sound economic policy, uh, very disciplined economic policy uh, in place. And that has enabled us to reduce inflation almost by 20 points in six months, from 45 percent, by 10 points, from 45 percent to 35 percent. And we hope to be able to bring it to, to teens uh, within the next few, few several months. Uh, that's an ambitious project, but we think it's doable. Uh, we have been able to control uh, uh, currency fluctuations. Now, the currency fluctuation has basically, since the November agreement, we've maintained currency fluctuations at a very reasonable rate, very reasonable rate. Uh, we've also been able to reduce, uh, uh, I mean, increase our uh, economic growth. Uh, our economic growth used to be, last year, minus 5%. Now, by, by March this year, we, we will bring it to zero. And hopefully we will start moving back to recovery, back to positive area, positive territory. So these are important achievements of this government, not simply because of uh, the easing of sanctions, partly to the psychological impact of sanctions relief, but mostly to do to economic discipline that is being exercised by the current government. Gentlemen at the back. We will, we will try to get to everyone, don't worry. Thank you very much, and, uh, Dr. and Minister Zarif, and welcome to Japan, and uh, thank you very much for your precious time today for us. My question is related with your nuclear issue. Could you give your name? And oh, I'm sorry, uh, my name is Masa Ota with Kyodo News, Japanese Wire Service, sorry for that. Uh, related with your nuclear issue, and the Japan is the only uh, you know, non-nuclear weapon state who has the uh, kind of the full scale of the uh, fuel cycle system up and out. Uh, up front, and we have an enrichment facility, and also we have a reprocessing facility in our model of Casio. But the, on the other hand, we have a kind of a robust inspection regime, which is specialized by the IAEA. Would you have a you know kind of a discussion with the Japanese authority on the uh, this type of this type of the uh, robust the uh, inspection regime? And I mean, uh, would you learn a lesson from the uh, Japanese side if we want to pursue the uh, peaceful use of the fuel cycle system? Thank you very much, Amba, uh, Minister. Well, uh, Japan has an interesting experience uh, in, in that area. Uh, and we certainly want to learn and have looked at Japanese practices. Of course, our program is not anywhere close to Japan. We don't intend to have a closed fuel cycle. We will have an open fuel cycle. We don't intend to have waste management. We don't in intend to have reprocessing. These are not areas that we intend to have. Of course, these are areas that are open to us, uh, theoretically and legally. 
but, but this is not our intention to engage, uh, at least immediately. We do not have a program right now uh, for, fuel cycle, for, for full fuel cycle activity. Uh, but, but these are issues to be discussed. So uh, we have looked at Japanese experience in terms of the type of monitoring that Japan has with the IAEA. Uh, at a certain stage, long time ago, but eight years ago, uh, we tried to copy that and we suggested that to, uh, at that time it was not EU3 plus three, it was just EU3. We suggested it to the EU3 that we would have the same type of robust inspection as Japan did, uh, but unfortunately the United States prevented that proposal from uh, even seeing the light of day. Uh, so that's gone. Now we have to look at a different uh, approach. We have a different uh, situation now, a uh, different international climate, uh, a different domestic Iranian climate, because the domestic climate in Iran has become very skeptical of the intentions of the West. It, it was much better, it was more easily manageable then than it is now. Be because at that time, the Iranian public had not gone through eight years of sanctions. Now, because of eight years of sanctions, the, 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 the public psyche in Iran is very sensitive to this type of international agreement. Got to be very careful in what we can do and what we cannot do, but we certainly try to learn from everybody, and Japan certainly provides a good example. Gentlemen here, gentlemen here, and then we'll move over to you two. Uh, my name is uh, Sakurayama uh, from Japanese News and Securo News. Um, you are talking very positive about uh, Japanese nuclear technology. Uh, I want to ask you now about uh, your view about the accident in Fukushima. Uh, well, uh you see, Japan has been able to address that uh, disaster. Uh, Iran is not prone to the same type of disaster as Japan was. Uh, we are an earthquake-prone country. Uh, the areas that we have our nuclear power stations, uh, or we plan to have our nuclear power stations in the future, are less susceptible to earthquakes than Japan is, uh, so uh, it's, it's a different environment. Uh, we understand uh, the concerns that exist here in Japan uh, on that issue. Uh, everybody has concerns about nuclear safety, and that is why we believe we can use Japanese technology, which is very much concentrated on safety, uh, nuclear safety, uh, in the future. Uh, but each, each country has its own uh, particular situation, and we respect the decision that Japanese people will make about their nuclear program, uh, and we hope that everybody else respects our decision. Hi, Eric Slavin with Stars and Stripes. I'd like to know whether you or whether Iran perceives the presence of the U.S. Fifth Fleet in the region to present a threat or something otherwise. And in a related note, I'd also like to know whether the current government uh, sees the closing of the Strait of Hormuz to be a legitimate tactic in achieving its aims, as previous governments have sometimes alluded to. Thank you. Well, we do not believe that uh, presence of foreign forces is conducive to greater security. Has never been. Presence of foreign forces always creates greater possibilities for miscalculations, greater propensity for resentment, and a good breeding ground for uh, violence and extremism. Uh, and that is why we hope that people will re-examine the proposition 
that we still have all the options on the table. We believe that the civilized world has taken off some options, including the threat or use of force from the table, not because the civilized world were pacifists, but because the use of force had lost its utility. Now, the United States has engaged in the threat or use of force uh, rather repeatedly, but has not gained much from it. Not want to go back to Vietnam, at least in the recent decade. Afghanistan and Iraq have not produced very tangible or uh, celebrated results for the Americans. So I think it would be useful if they, if they stopped. There are other possible avenues of influencing international events that the United States can engage in that would be much more civilized. Uh, having said that, we, we uh, intend to exercise a very civilized foreign policy. So we don't engage in, in threatening to use force. Of course, we will defend our country, our integrity, our uh, territorial integrity, as well as our uh, national dignity and national interest with vigor and with determination and with sacrifice if that's necessary. But the policy of this government is not to bolster about that. The policy of this government is to try to bring the possibilities of the need to resort to force to a minimum, both for us as well as for our adversaries. And I think that's a more prudent policy than just uh, repeated statements that all options are on the table. That's not a good policy. That's not a prudent policy. And worse than that, that's not a legal policy. It's illegal. Sorry, sorry. You're next. Mm. Per Botner, uh, Real Politica from Sweden. When when or and if there are talks with uh, between your country and the big empire in the west what do they tell you when you say that when you compare that United uh, United States has has 2002 in the year uh, of 2009 they had 2200 warheads, nuclear warheads, ready to send out. What do they tell you <laughs> when, when you tell these things to them? Well, I, I think they have an opportunity to tell their story to the rest of the world, that some people believe security could be achieved through being able to destroy everybody else, including themselves, a hundred times. Um, um, that's why they call it mad, mutually assured destruction. And I really believe it's mad. You won't get, I mean, in it, uh, uh, getting out of rhetoric. Now, t I talk as, as, as somebody who's taught international relations. In our world today, everything is globalized. People will laugh at you if you tell them that I'm going to protect my environment while other people's environments are in jeopardy. People will laugh at you if you say, I'm going to prevent greenhouse gases while everybody's greenhouse emissions are hit hitting your roof. People will laugh. People will laugh at you if you say, we, I'm going to have prosperity within my borders because economic globalization is a fact of life. What people still need to understand is that the same applies to security, that you cannot have security at the expense of insecurity of others, that you, it, deterrence doesn't mean much. It's to live under the nightmare. I visited New York, I lived in New York for a very long time, and I visited New York after 9-11, and I saw the sense of insecurity in the faces of New Yorkers, whom, had, whom I had come to know for a very long time. You saw the sense of insecurity. What is the security that could be achieved, even by the United States? 
if the rest of the world is insecure. So I, I would tell them that it doesn't make sense. And I believe former secretaries of state of the United States who wrote an opinion piece in the Wall Street Journal that the United States need, and, and Russia for that matter, and France and Germany and China, need to move towards a nuclear-free world is a much better, more serious option than this madness of mutually assured destruction that they are pursuing. This gentleman here. I'm sorry, Your Excellency, do you have time for two more questions? Can we... I have time until 4 o'clock, so... Okay. So I'll, I'll try to make my answers <laughs> short so that we can get to two more questions. Uh, hi, I'm Yoshitake from Asahi Shimbun, Ruzome uh, Asahi in Farsi. Uh, my question is uh, about the uh, agenda for this, uh, your, uh, your visit. And uh, restoring the economic ties uh, is probably the, one of the biggest agenda uh, between Japan and Iran. And uh, I'd like to listen to your ex expectation for Japanese side action uh, in the field. The joint plan of action uh, has direct impact. And your expectation? expectation for Japanese action generally? Well, I think, uh, I mean, as I said, Japan was a good trading partner for Iran, was a good partner generally, reliable, and Iran has been a reliable uh, energy partner for Japan. Uh, and I think it is in the interest of everybody to, to resume that partnership. Now, Japan has become absent from Iranian markets for a long time. Japan has become absent from Iranian uh, development for a long time, both in terms of our, I mean, uh, green economy. Uh, Japan has a very strong uh, reliance, a very strong preference uh, to encourage uh, green technology. Uh, so it's important for, for, for Japan to get more active with Iran in that area. Uh, oil and gas, that has been an area where we've been working together for a very long time, starting from 1953 when Japan uh, got its first oil shipment from Iran. Uh, I heard that the book uh, describing that has become a best bestseller here in Japan in 2013. So uh, a lot of possibilities are there. Nuclear cooperation is another possibility. Uh, possibility in, in uh, other areas of technology and trade and investment. Uh, as I said, petrochemicals, uh, $75 billion uh, possibility of investment for, for, for Japan. Uh, so we're, we're going to discuss all of these. Uh, we, are, we, we also have uh, common uh, challenges. Uh, Japan is interested in Afghanistan. Japan is interested in uh, generally peace and security in the Persian Gulf region. All of these are issues that we will, we will discuss and have discussed since this morning and will discuss uh, in the uh, meeting that I'll have after this session with you. هستم از رادیوی فارسی اینشکه ورد اگه اجاز بدین من چون باید به صدا رو پخش بکنیم به فارسی بپرسم سوال و به فارسی هم ممکنه جواب بدیم Is it possible we, I ask question in Persian and he answer in Persian because we know it's a Persian radio for اینشکه ورد As long as we get an English translation that's we don't have um, we don't have the capability. So to just uh, because it's in Persian, you know, we have to, you know, I mean, the broadcast <laughs> in Persian. That's why I, I have to record, you know, his. I'll, I'll answer. defer to his excellence. I, I don't mind uh, <laughs> as long as everybody else is okay with it. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll okay. say what I said in Persian in English afterwards. Is that okay with you? Thank you, to Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Man, again, just a bit. صحبت آقای روحانی رئیس جمهوری ایران رو به نقل از خودشون بگم 
او در صحبتهایی که در مجلس خبرگان در نشست خبرگان داشتند ایشون اشاره کردند که گروه پنج به علاوه یک غنی سازی رو پذیرفتن اما بحث در اینه که در یک دوره این سطح و حد غنی سازی به تعبیر اونها بگونه ای باشه که بیشتر اعتماد آفرین باشه ایشون در مورد دوره صحبت کردند و آیا میشه تعبیر کرد صحبت ایشون رو که بعد از این دوره ای که حالا ما نمیدونیم منظورشون شش ماه هست یا هر چه دوره ای که هستش قنی سازی افزایش پیدا بکنه اون چه که در برنامه مشترک اقدام ژنو هست این است که دوره نهایی ما یه دوره شش ماهه داریم الان یک دوره نهایی هم داریم که برای اعتماد آفرینی به عنوان مرحله نهایی حتی مرحله نهایی هم بر اساس توافق ژنو یک دوره ای داره اون دوره رو باید ما تعیین بکنیم که چه مقداره در اون دوره ما یه رکش محدودیت هایی رو میپذیریم ضمن این که غرب هم میپذیره پنج به اضافه یک هم پذیرفته که در اون دوره برنامه غنیسازی ایران ادامه پیدا میکنه اما با یک شرایطی اون شرایط شرایط نامحدود نیست فقط برای یه دوره است بعد از اون دوره ایران میتونه مثل هر کشور دیگه ای که برنامه سلحامیز هستهی داره برنامه سلحامیز شو ادامه ببخشید میزان قنی سازی درصدش افزایش پیدا نمیکنه از این بستگی به اون زمان داره این بعد با فعلا داریم راجع به یک دوره ای صحبت میکنیم the question that she asks is that president rohani uh, has mentioned uh, yesterday that the limitations that we will accept for our enrichment program will be uh, will be just for a for a finite period of time And, I, and, and she asked me whether that was the six months that was envisaged in the first phase. And my response was that the first phase is a temporary phase. But even the final phase is not an indefinite phase. Iran will accept, the, 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 uh, the president pointed out that five plus one have accepted Iran's enrichment. That is in the plan of action. That they have said that Iran will continue to enrich. but with certain limitations to be agreed upon. But those limitations will apply only to, for a period of time, again, to be agreed upon. And that is also very clearly stated in the plan of action. That is, the final phase is not an indefinite phase. It's a defined period of time to be agreed upon between the two parties. And one of the issues that we will need to discuss within the next five months is To, to define what is the length of that period. Once Iran implements the final phase in, in uh, good faith, then Iran's nuclear program, according again to the joint plan of action adopted in Geneva, will be dealt with just like any other non-nuclear weapon state member of the NPT, like Japan. So that is the objective. The first objective is for a time for Iran to have a, an agreed enrichment and then to have an enrichment program just, or any other nuclear, peaceful nuclear program just like any other non-nuclear weapon state member of the NPT. Do you have time for one more question? Sure, if you ask it. You want to ask it or somebody else? I'm, I'm going to give it to <laughs> okay. Tom. Thank you and thank you for that great translation. <laughs> <coughs> If I lose my job, I can have some. <laughs> I, Thomas Sullivan, Matthias Energy, um, Foreign Minister, thank you for coming today. I, I wanted to follow up on your comments on the oil and gas investments that you're seeking for Iran. You'd mentioned a figure of 100 billion. I was just wondering if you could elaborate on what type of investments they might be. Is it, is it uh, drilling? Is it refineries? Is it export terminals, etc.? Thank you. Well, mostly exploration and, and uh, uh, offshore, particularly offshore explorations and, and drilling. But, but I'm, not, I'm not an expert in that field, uh, and I'm, I believe in expertise, so I do not talk about things that I don't know much about. Uh, but I know that the, uh, our petroleum ministry is uh, trying to revise uh, the terms of its uh, contracts with the uh, Uh, foreign investors uh, and uh, have asked for input from foreign investors in order to make these contracts more uh, appealing uh, to international investment. Uh, 
uh, and they are going to finalize it within the next couple of months. So the possibilities are there in various fields, but, but I know that uh, exploration and, and drilling are, are one, of, one of the major important fields, and, and we have a lot of uh, oil and gas in offshore particularly that needs to be worked on. Well, thank you very much for that. You've certainly given us all a lot to, to think about, if not on the oil and gas industry. Um, there's one thing left for me to do, and that is to give you a one-year honorary membership. Thank you. The club. Thank you. So I hope you will come back, and uh, I would like to thank you again. Yeah, I hope it's renewable. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye.